Reginald? Yes, sir. Quick favor, can you remotely activate the self-destruction device? Of course, sir. Blast radius? I don't know. Five meters? Uh, make it half a meter. Sure. Are you okay, sir? Yeah, I'm... I'm fine, I'm fine. The aliens in the Predator franchise are part of a species called Yaucha. Their appearance is very anthropomorphic and strictly biologically speaking, there isn't much to talk about beyond their weird mandibles and hair-like appendages. Most of their extraordinary abilities are in fact derived from the use of tools, advanced weaponry. As I was writing this episode, the subsequent question arose. Can I talk about technology as an extension of a species biology? Let's look at humans' ability to acquire knowledge, build tools and use them to alter everything in their environment. It feels intuitive that this isn't the same as this. And when two things have distinct nature, we like to have words to differentiate them. Synthetic, artificial, sometimes even unnatural, all of these adjectives are used as synonyms for human-made, often in a negative connotation in opposition to natural. But where do we draw the line? Why do we get to be so special? While I do acknowledge that humans' ability to shape the world is hardly matched in terms of skill and impact, to me, Building a city is not fundamentally different from building a dam. Firing a rifle is not fundamentally different from throwing a rock. And if the latter examples are part of a species biology, it may be argued that the former also are. So for this video, I'll consider that the predator's arsenal isn't less part of its biology and identity than its anatomical and physiological features. Once the predator removes his mask, we get to see the beautiful design of the monster's face. Well, beautiful. Someone would not agree with me. One ugly mother Maybe you didn't know, but the predator didn't always look like that. In fact, there were two different designs. The first one looked like a weird two-legged insect, and Jean-Claude Van Damme was actually wearing the suit at the time, and he hated it. Do you like sushi? The suit looked pretty bad, especially the head, and was extremely impractical to use. Schwartzy, Schwartzy. Schwartzy recommended getting help from Stan Winston, whom he worked with on the set of Terminator. The mandibles were an addition suggested by James Cameron himself while working with Winston on Aliens. Of course, if I say mandibles, you're probably thinking of insect mandibles. Those pair of jaws are extremely useful for gripping, biting, and cutting. But when I see the predator's mouth, I cannot unsee the physical similarities with spider fangs, also called chelicerae. Spiders use their chelicerae as a biological equivalent of hypodermic needles. In fact, they use them so they can penetrate the body of their prey and inject venom. Yaucha don't produce toxins, however, they do use their mandibles to immobilize food while eating. I always thought it was weird for such an advanced organism to still have extra appendages around the mouth, especially for anthropomorphic species possessing hands. But there might be a couple of reasons why the predator still has those structures which seem to be more vestigial than useful. The first is that predators use their mandibles for communication. In fact, this is how they produce their iconic clicking sound. And the second reason is that predator might use their mandibles to press buttons behind their mask which would allow them to control part of their arsenal without having 
to use their hands. As I said before, movable structures around the mouth are more often found in invertebrates, like insects, than in vertebrates. Two examples come to my mind though. The cephalic fins of the manta ray, which they use to push plankton into their mouth during feeding, Researchers are trying to understand if these fins might have other functions like sensing, steering or even communication. The other example is Neoclinus blanchardi or the sarcastic fringe head. These fish have a gigantic extensible mouth which they use to fire during terrestrial battles, bearing a striking resemblance with our favorite alien hunter. Stan Winston designed the Predator with dreadlocks, apparently inspired by a painting of an otherworldly Rastafarian warrior. The truth is that these are not hair. They are made of flesh and they are attached to the base of the skull, suggesting they might provide some form of sensory input. If we dig deeper into different media beyond the silver screen, uh, we can find a bit more information about their actual Function. In the book Predator South China Sea, they refer to them as snake like sensors, which help give the predator um, amazing balance and reflexes. I like to think that they may contain organs similar to our vestibular system, a sensory system located in our inner ear, um, involving creating a sense of balance and spatial orientation. Little fact about me during my first ever research internship, I had to prepare fish otoliths for analysis. Um, otoliths are those tiny stones which are inside the vestibular system and which help perceive linear acceleration. And they contain so much information. In fact, from them you can predict the species, the age, the length, the weight of the fish but also the physical chemical properties of the water it has occupied during its life. I know, I diverge, but who knows, maybe the predator quills also contain some form of otoliths. Good subject for a research internship. In the comics, a human character who joined a predator clan was told to cut her actual dreadlocks short to be less attractive to male hunters. So these appendages also seem to have a key role in mate attraction. Sexy. Yauchas use vocal mimicry for distracting, luring or simply taunting their victims. They appear to be naturally capable of copying human speech, but they can also use their helmet to record and replay sounds. In nature, birds are definitely among the greatest animals at replicating human voices and sounds. They can do that because they possess a vocal organ called the syrinx, very similar to our vocal cords. And this organ is located at the base of the trachea, so they can produce two sounds at once. Parrots are extremely good at mimicking human language. They use their tongue to modulate sounds and their brain evolved a unique song system which enhances their vocal learning abilities. What the? Wow, I got popcorn. Peekaboo! I'm gonna go get you. Oh. Alright, mom, gotta go shopping. So shut up. Saber. One of the most iconic abilities of the predator is its thermal vision. All objects warmer than absolute zero give off infrared radiation. And because of this, thermal vision allows us to visualize our surroundings even in the absence of visible light. In nature, many animals can detect infrared radiations. However, their perception of heat is different from how a thermal camera might render an image. So it's not vision in the same way we typically understand it. Among those animals, you'll find mosquitoes, beetles, bats, and snakes. The latter ones possess specialized organs called pit 
organs. In certain species of snakes, like vipers, this allowed the detection of warm objects from several meters away, even in the absence of light. These organs were believed to have evolved mainly for detecting prey. However, recent findings indicate they might also play a role in temperature regulation and identifying predators, suggesting they have broader sensory functions than previously assumed. At a certain point during the second movie, heat vision is not enough to detect enemies. Fortunately, the predator's helmet is equipped with a series of other visions, including Bees, butterflies, reindeers and birds among others are all animals capable of seeing beyond our visible spectrum, in particular in the ultraviolet light range. This is believed to help the detection of food and traces left by prey, but also how these animals interact sexually. So, Let's take a moment to talk about ultraviolet tits. Hmm. Let me explain. Male and female blue tits are difficult to differentiate based on plumage alone using the human eye. Uh, the cool thing is that this species has ultraviolet vision and both sexes um, exhibit bright ultraviolet feathers with females on average having lower intensity. Several studies suggest that this ultraviolet plumage coloration has an important signaling function in the context of sexual selection. I think this is a good example of how human eyes are not always enough to understand the world around us. Our vision is a very limited prism. What we call the visible spectrum is in fact the human visible spectrum and everything around us exists in infinite colors and shades in the eyes of other living things. One of the coolest features of the predator is their ability to turn almost completely invisible. In fact, they possess a cloaking device which bends lights around its user, even though this refraction leaves imperfections that are detectable to the human eye. In nature, no animal can become literally invisible in the way we might imagine from science fiction or fantasy stories. However, several animals have evolved remarkable camouflage and transparency mechanisms that allow them to blend in almost seamlessly with their surroundings and appear nearly invisible to the naked eye. This is a topic I have explored in detail in one of my other videos. Of course, cephalopod camouflage would be what I consider to be the closest equivalent in nature to an invisibility cloak. But there I also talk about different types of camouflage in other animals, so yeah, go check it out. The self-destruct device, part of the predator's wrist gear, is a potent Yaucha explosive. It's used both for an honorable self and in potential defeat, and to erase any trace of them, ensuring that the tech doesn't end up in the hands of other species. It is essential gear typically always carried on hunts. The concept of self-destruction in animals often pertains to behavior or adaptations that can kill the animal, but in doing so provide some form of advantage often related to the survival of the colony. This type of suicidal altruism is called autothesis, from the Greek essentially meaning self-sacrifice. You probably know that when honeybees sting, the stinger along with the venom sac often becomes lodged in the enemy and is ripped from the bee's body. This process fatally wounds the bee but delivers a dose of venom to deter the threat. But are there animals out there which literally explode to eliminate an enemy? Well, yes, there are species of termites and ants which can actively rupture their own body to release sticky and toxic secretions in order to immobilize or repel threats. The most well-known one is probably Colobopsis saundersi or the Malaysian explosive ant. To me, what makes the predator um, a good movie monster are its motivations. 
In fact, predators don't kill for survival. Humans are not really a threat and they don't need us for sustenance. Predators seem to hunt um, as a form of sportsmanship or a rite of passage. It's almost entertainment to them. And there is something so terrifying to me in being tirelessly hunted, not for necessity, but by choice. Moreover, their anthropomorphic design subconsciously evokes um, an expectation of empathy. But besides their strict code of honor to only hunt or eat prey, their commitment to killing is everything but empathetic. Thank you for watching the video, I hope you liked it and if you did please consider commenting, sharing, subscribing, you know the deal. And if you want to support the channel even more, you can also become one of my beloved patrons on Patreon. Or you can also buy some of my cool new merch on the Cosmic Toxin store. Thank you again for watching, that's it for me today, um, I'll see you very soon. Bye.